Spiritual Warfare 2, Lesson 2, Beware of False Allies. So Christians should have allies within the army of God. I will say many Christians and churches, we can put them together because you can't have a church without so-called Christians, we'll say. But they refuse to partner with others. And sometimes it leads me to wonder, is this because they would be the false allies? That, that is big in this region is because many churches, they don't want to associate with each other because one, that at times they feel pressure from their own denomination when we can't fellowship with them because they don't belong to our denomination. Last time I checked, the word says that we are to be one body joined together with Jesus Christ the head. Doesn't say anything about denominations. Doesn't say anything about, you know, you got to stay in your little sect. You got to stay in your little group. Actually, it says the opposite of that. We're to be together as one body to serve God. Amen. And this is one of the reasons I've been endeavoring to finish our series on Know the Foundations because of Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Because if you can gather around those foundations, then you, shouldn't, you really shouldn't have any you know, squabbles or however you want to say it with any other church because you can hunker around those core doctrines and come together with, in agreement with that. And let everything else just be, well, y'all may believe that. You may have scripture for it, but we kind of believe differently. But we have scripture for that. But, hey, if we agree on these, let's just serve God together. That's the way it's supposed to work. But you'll find that many churches, they back off because maybe they will be the false allies. Or they believe you're a false ally just because you don't belong to their denomination. What's also damning is when you have... Many, you know, we'll say pastors or churches that say, hey, let's get together and do this. And when it comes time to get together and do that, they like, nope, no, thank you. We don't want to do that. It's like, wait a minute. So, in other words, you want to violate a scripture of let your yay be yay and your nay be nay just to save face in front of somebody but then not follow through. So you violate scripture to save face. Hmm. That lets me know what kind of Christian, what kind of ally you are. You're a false one because you tell me something. Now, granted, when I'm saying that, I mean for any of us because we've probably all had that experience. Hey, I'm going to come to your church sometime. Hey, I'm going to do this. Let's get together and pray sometime. Hey, let's get together and do Bible study sometime or whatever the case may be, and then they never follow through with it. Why? Because they may give in to that emotion in the moment, but then they back, they kind of backpedal because their heart's not really in it it felt good at the moment to say it, but their heart's not really in it. So obviously you and God don't mean that much to them as much as they said that, they, that you both did. <laughs> uh, this is why this lesson is a page and a half. Amen. <laughs> so although many Christians are happy to join with other believers, we'll say some, some choose to be false allies, a.k.a. terrors. So although many Christians, because... You, especially when you're in the same denomination, you know, many of them love to be together because they're like, hey, you're safe, we're safe because we belong to the same denomination. And so that is big, but even within denominations, you have some that will join together. Like right now, I can think of a, of a testimony in this town where there's three or four of the same denomination churches, but two on the outskirts of town won't fellowship one with the middle with the one in the middle of town because they believe a little bit differently. All the same denomination. That's a spiritual demon is what that is. That is a demon that is coming and trying to breed division, dissension, trying to breed issues, and those people are not seeing it for the demon that it is, and they allow it to breed in their life to where they don't fellowship with the body of Christ or they cut themselves off to make themselves an island, which is against the word of God. Yeah. Amen. So again, they violate scripture to save face or they violate scripture in order to cut themselves off and to make themselves feel like they're being holy when they're not. Anyway, so Matthew 13, 27 through 30 says, So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst now this not thou sow good seed in thy field? So you can say these workers are coming. They're blaming the guy that's in charge of the house. They're blaming the guy that's in charge. Didn't you sow good, feed, good, seed, uh, good seed into the field? And what's his response? Well, they, they go on and ask another question. From whence then hath it tares? 
And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. An enemy hath done this. The householder, the one that's in charge, he instantly knows it's an enemy that has sown these tares among what I have sown that was good. So we, we've got to be aware, we've got to be aware that everybody that's around us may not be good allies. Now, praise God, we are a pretty strong church unit, and I love that about us. But we've also got to be careful that we don't become the false ally or we don't allow others to come in to be a false ally and that we allow them, we get close to them and allow their being a tear hinder our growth as being weak. But we also ourselves don't need to be start off as wheat and then all of a sudden down the inside that we'll see here in a moment and have that blackness, that darkness on the inside of us turn us into a tear. Because it's all about choice. Now, granted, when it comes to natural things, a, a wheat, it's a wheat. It's not going to change what it is. A tear is not going to change to become a wheat. It can't. It's, it's just part of nature that a tear is a tear, a wheat's a wheat. But when it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to human interaction, human spirituality in that regard of being a Christian or not, it's pure choice. It's pure choice. Because God does not predestinate, all right, I like you, so you're coming to heaven. I don't like you, you're going to hell. I kind of like you, so maybe I'll let you in. I can't stand you, so you're ultimately going to hell. That's not the God, how way God works. The way God works, it says, I have sent my son, Jesus Christ, to die for everybody. So that anybody, so the call goes out to many, but there's only a few that's chosen. Why are there only a few chosen? Because those chosen are the only ones that said, I'll answer that call. I'll accept what Jesus has to offer. I'll accept what you'll give me, God. Those are the, the few that are chosen because they answer that call. And they are the wheat, which we should be. So he said unto them, an enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? So in other words, these servants have a right heart. All right, if they're bad... Then let's, uh, you want us to go gather them up and pull them out so they're not growing with the wheat and cause issues. But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. So, in other words, because these tares and these wheat are so much intertwined, they're so close in gathering and being together, planted in the field. He said, If you go over and you begin to root up a tear, you begin to, to take it out. He said, what you're going to do is you're going to mess with the soil, you're going to mess with the foundation of the wheat, and you'll hinder it, that you'll hurt it, rather than just leaving it, letting it grow and mature, and then they'll be gathered at a different time at the time of harvest. So he says, let's let, let, let it be, and at the proper time, they'll be separated. So what's this, what, you, what does that look like for us, Pastor? Well, that looks like when people come in, you know, and we see maybe they're a terror, and we're not gonna, I'm not going to call them out by name after a few services and say, all right, you Billy Bob, you're a terror, you don't belong here, get out of here. Because you're not doing any good for our local house, you're, you're hurting the wheat, so get out of here. That's not the way that that works. What the householder here is saying, what the man in the house is saying, he says, let them stay together. He said, at the proper time of harvest, he said, they'll be separated. Well, when you have somebody that's, when you have a pastor or a preacher, and that's Part of the job of a shepherd is to say, all right, look here, we're going to preach on this. I'm going to preach it hard. I'm going to let the word of God just come out like a, like a hot knife, just slicing through butter. And I'm just going to let it do its thing. And usually the terror will take itself out. The goat will separate itself. Because they don't like to be, they don't like to be around the holiness. They don't like to be around the true things of God because... They don't want to change who they are. They'd rather serve themselves as God and allow everybody else to say, all right, I'm just, I'm, I, don't want, I don't want to go here. I don't want to change. And obviously this pastor, he's, he's, wanting, he's, he's a cult leader. He, he wants this. He wants that. And I'm not, I'm not into that because I want to be my God. I want to be my own leader. And so they separate themselves. When truth of the matter is, it's not being a cult leader. It's there's a tear on the radar. There's a goat on the radar. There's a wolf on the radar. I'm going to preach the word of God. The word of God is the word of God. We're going to let it do its thing. And if they, they can either line up with the word of God, not just because of the pastor or the preacher, they can line up with the word of God and allow God to change them to make them who they need to be, who he wants them to be, or they'll just get tired of it and leave. 
Amen. <laughs> but he says, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you, all, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So notice at the time of harvest. Now this may be you know, a message that's preached. And there's, there comes a harvest for that because the wheat says, I want to harvest the good things of God. I want to be in that harvest. Or the tares says, I don't want anything to do with that. And so when it comes time for the harvest of that message, now granted that's a smaller scale, that they say, well, I'm just going to separate and I'm going to leave. But on the bigger scale, and what is really being portrayed here, what Jesus is saying, it comes time for judgment day. When it comes time for the time of judgment. He says that's the harvest that you will see that separation of the wheat and the tares. Because the tares, he says, they will bind them up in bundles and burn them. Well, that's an allegory for hell. Tares will not make it into heaven. But wheat are gathered up into his barn. Notice, it says, bind them in bundles to burn them. I'm talking about the tares. But gather the wheat into my barn. So there is some ownership of the householder to say, gather up the wheat, the good stuff, and bring it to my barn because it's useful for me. So Jesus speaks about the man sowing good seed, which is wheat in his field. And then tares are dangerous weeds that can cause issues for the wheat's growth and health. So, so the tares are dangerous weeds. Now, of course, I have a definition. I added this to our notes here. A weed is a plant that is not of value. Now, however you want to lay that out, that's up to you. But that's the definition of a weed. It's a plant that is not of value that tends to choke out desirable plants. Like right now, I can think of our house. <laughs> but I can think of in our, in our front yard, we got this little area where it's, you know, it's had mulch and nice little things growing. And, and so... Well, since probably last fall sometime, it's been a little neglected because we've had things going on. So there are weeds in our little area that's by our shrubs and a tree that we have. And it needs more mulch, which I went and bought the mulch. But I've got to go in and dig in all, or dig out all of the weeds that have been growing in that area before I can put mulch down. Why? Because I don't want those weeds to keep coming back and to keep growing. I need to pull those things out. So it doesn't, it quits being an eyesore and, and taking all the nutrients and all the things out from all everything else that's trying to grow there. So now with a weed, what it does is it's, it has no value to it. That doesn't mean that somebody that's a tear or somebody that's a weed comes in and they have no value. Now I'm not talking about marijuana weed. I'm talking about an actual plant weed. Somebody that has no value. I'm not saying that they can never amount to anything. It's that, when they're a weed and they're a tear, they're of no value to the kingdom of God. Why? Because they haven't surrendered unto Jesus Christ. They haven't surrendered to God. And so until they surrendered, then once they make that because they come a, become a new creature in Christ, then they become valuable to the kingdom of God because now they're part of the kingdom. You know, just as much as, you know, those, those weeds are trying to grow in our pretty area, I don't know what you'd even call it, our landscaping, however you want to call it, just because those weeds are trying to grow there does not mean that they belong there and it will adds value to our landscaping. If anything else, it's an eyesore and a time suck. <laughs> that's pretty harsh, Pastor. Well, that's exactly what it is because now I've got to sacrifice time. I can be spending with my kids, spending with my wife, spending at church, spending with you guys or whatever the case may be. i got to go out there and pull those stupid weeds. i to pull them out because you can't just use a weed eater and chop them down because they'll grow right back. You got to get to the root of them, pull them out, throw them as far as you can and say, don't come back here, you little demon. And pull it out and pull it out again and throw it again. And then you keep pulling all those things out until they're all gone. But it, when you do that, it, the nutrients can go to other things. The nutrients within the ground can go to other things and help it to grow and thrive. But these tares are dangerous weeds that can cause issues for the wheat's growth and health. These tares... Now, like my pastor, I'm going to get a little scientific on you. Not as much as he would. But there are, these tares are bearded darnels. Bearded darnels are poisonous grass 
that is almost indistinguishable from wheat that, that has black grains on the inside of them. So it looks like wheat. It will grow, but when it grows, there's something on the inside of these bearded darnels, or darnels, or however you want to say it. There's a black grain on the inside of them. What does that represent? The sin and darkness that does not want to give over to the light of God, to the salvation of God. But yet it's in the same area. It's going to grow with the wheat. It's going to be in the same place. But there's something black on the inside of it that says, I really don't want to produce anything. I just want to be here, take up the nutrients, help choke that thing out, help choke that one out, and just be here to take up time and space. That's dangerous. Amen. Just so we're all on the same page, I don't feel like this is anybody here. So don't be taking this and applying it to yourself and saying, am I a bearded darn or am I a tear? No, 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 no. If you were, I would talk to you. I would preach harder. I might call your name out. You know, I was preaching just to give you an example. I don't always do that. But, you know, just to try to drop some hints. <laughs> but nobody here in, on my radar is a bearded darn or you're a tear, anything like that. Praise God. That's, that should be a cause to celebrate because many churches can't say that. Many pastors and, and preachers can't say that their whole church, they feel like they're all wheat. Amen. So rejoice. Amen. These darnels can, can be distinguished from the wheat as both begin to mature. As both begin to mature. Because what happens is when you take the wheat, as it grows up, the, the weight of the wheat begins to bow it over, begins to lean over and to bow. The bearded darnel, when it grows up, it just stands erect and stands straight. That almost is significant. It's worth studying out if you really would like to because that shows that the tear is all in pride and won't bow to anybody or anything. But yet the wheat, when it starts to grow, it bows to the presence of the Creator. It bows to the presence of God, saying, I know that I'm not worthy to be in your sight. I'm going to bow at your feet, Father. I'm going to bow at the, at the Creator. I'm going to bow at the one, we could say the landscaper, so to speak, the one that is planted me. I'm going to bow in His presence. But the bearded darnel says, nope, it's all about me. I've got black on the inside. I'm not going to produce anything but death and choke out anything that's around me. So I, it's all about me. <laughs> that, what's, that is what makes a false ally. That is the reason we must be careful that just because somebody says they're a Christian, now you've got to judge fruit. Not judge them to heaven or hell, but judge fruit to say, are you really a wheat, or are you a really a tear? And you can judge it by the fruit. Are they you know, puffed up and stuck up in pride because they won't bow to honor God and really show Him that they belong to Him? Or do they really honor Him and bow at the presence of God and say, yes, Father, whatever you want. Yes, Father, you know, praise God. I love God. They say it, but then their life reflects it. I've even got... You know, pastor friends of mine who, who will say, yeah, man, we need to get together and do this. We need to pray. We need to do this and do that. But I can tell who mean it and who doesn't. Yeah. I actually had a dear friend of mine that's a pastor in this area. Uh, he texted me this morning. It just, you know, out of the blue, he was just texting me. And I thought, you know, this man actually has a heart for other pastors and, and love for people like that. Yeah. And I thought, praise God. But that isn't the first time he's done that. It's been a something that continues to be his reputation and his lifestyle because that's his heart. Not just his mouth, but his heart. So I would say, that pastor is a wheat. He is good ground that I can, that I can fellowship with. And he's not a false ally, he's a true ally. Amen. So these darnels are also known as false wheat. Well, that makes sense. If they look just like wheat. <laughs> this is the one instance <laughs> you... <laughs> You can't say, looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck, because it looks like wheat, it acts like wheat, but it doesn't com completely grow like wheat. It's a false wheat. So you've got to be careful of that little bit of deception there, because it tries to pass itself off as wheat, but it's really false. False allies can come in many forms. One such form is that those that claim to be Christian but do not hold to God's word or doctrine. They don't hold to God's word or doctrine. You know, when you see somebody, they can say, well, I, I, you know, I love God, I'm a Christian. Well, where do you go to church? Well, I don't really go to church anymore. Well, okay. 
That's a, that's a red flag, number one. Because the Word of God has multiple scriptures that says, well, well, I'll quote Hebrews for you, 1025, for, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. That's talking about church attendance. In Luke, I want to say it's chapter 4, I could be wrong on that, but it said Jesus had a custom of going to the temple, going to the synagogue. Why? Because he had a habit, he had a custom of going to church to worship God. So if we're to be not just Christ-like, and I want to start changing how I say that, because I've said for a long time, and it's kind of been ingrained in me, that Christians were to be Christ-like. I want to challenge us not to be Christ-like, but to be as Christ was, as Christ is. Because many people will have the Christ-like form, but deny the power. But if we are, if we are to be as Christ was, or as Christ is, uh, given he's our example, it's on heaven, now he sits at the right hand of the Father. So as he was, then that shows that we conduct ourselves the way that God wants us to by living the example as Jesus did. So coming back to this, so one such form is those that claim to be a Christian but do not hold to God's word or doctrine. Many people say, well, I'm, I'm a Christian, I go to church. Well, Jesus had a habit of going to church. Where do you go to church at? Well, I don't go to church. Red flag number one. Doesn't mean that they're perfect. Maybe they're in a transition. Well, we left this church because of some bad doctrine, so now we're trying to find where to land. Okay, we understand that. I've been there a time or two in the military, you know, because we knew that we were called and grafted word, but being in the military, we couldn't travel back and forth all the time, especially being in Louisiana. That had been a, a long Sunday. <laughs> but, you know, but what we did do is we found churches that were local that we could attend, and any time we were in town in Cookville, we went, we went back to our home church. So saying that to say, we understand that we, we would go to a church a couple of weeks. Uh, that's, nah, that's not our flavor. That's not where God wants us to be. Then we go to another church. We'd have to visit to figure out, all right, Lord, where do you want us to be in this town while we're here? And so that did take a little bit of time. But when you have that, when you find that where you're supposed to be, you get rooted, grounded, and planted, and you don't leave until... You're supposed to Amen. leave at the appropriate time. Yes, Amen. Amen. So, that's, so that would be a red flag. So that would maybe be the only exception of somebody saying, well, because of this, I need to leave. Not because they got offended. Not because they got other issues that, you know, the pastor stomped on their toes or stomped on their pet sin that they chose to leave. But they left because there was some bad doctrine. There were some issues that were going against the word of God, going against the things of God. Anyway. So, but people, many people will say, well, I love God. I'm, I'm going to hold his doctrine, but they live like a pagan. They live like the world. That's, an, that's another red flag. If, when they really don't live out the word of God, granted that nobody's going to be perfect, but when they live more pagan than they do scripture, that's another red flag. To say, something's not adding up right. I'm not good at math, but I can tell this doesn't add up. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> But having the truth of God within a soldier through the Holy Spirit, as well as knowing the battle guide, will display the commander-in-chief's heart for every soldier's life. So in other words, if you're a real soldier, as we're talking about spiritual warfare, if you're a real soldier of God, you should catch the, command, the, the commander-in-chief's heart through using the battle guide, which we have described as the Bible, but also through the NCO, the Holy Spirit, non-commissioned officer who works with you every day, you're still going to display more of the heart of God than you will looking like pagan or culture. So 1 Timothy 1.18, Amplified, says, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, so that, so that inspired and aided by them, you may fight the good fight in contending with false teachers. So this equation should hold every soldier accountable for every action. This equation, how Paul wrote this out to Timothy, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you. So obviously, God moved, whether it be Paul's life or somebody else, to speak these prophecies over Timothy, to, to give him maybe a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, as we could go through the gifts of the Spirit, manifestations of the Spirit, that these were spoken over him for him to have that knowledge and have that wisdom of how to handle things, maybe what's coming down the pike that he knows, all right, this is what I need to be prepared for. So this equation helps him because now he can say, all right, these prophecies are going to aid me, they're going to inspire me, they're going to help me to keep fighting the good fight of faith. 
to fight against the false teachers, to fight against the false doctrines. So the prophecies, even we have a better sure word of prophecy, which is the word of God that's in the Bible. So if we use the word of God, we use the things that have been spoken over us and to us by the manifestations of the spirit, or by spiritual leadership over us, then that should help us recognize all right, this person over here is going to be a false ally. Because I've actually had some people come up to me and say, hey, you know, we, need to, we should preach this thing together. We should preach this revival together. We should do this together. We should do this ministry opportunity together. And part of me is like, mm, I don't know. Something's not sitting right. And then all of a sudden they open their mouth and you, you, I begin to hear their doctrine. And I'm like, well, that's exactly what it is. I'm not hitching my horse to that wagon. Amen. I'm not hitching that horse to <laughs> I started to say, I'm not hitching my horse to some donkey, but that might be a little controversial because I'm not, I'm not being in the same yoke and being bonded together. Anyway, <laughs> take it however you want to. But those that hold to false doctrines must reevaluate how knowledgeable they are to the battle guide and commanders. So those that hold, hold false doctrine. Now, granted, it's one thing to be ignorant and to not know any better, but there's another thing to be given the truth and you say, oh, I don't want to receive that. If you've been given the truth, if you've been given anything by Scripture, even if it's a heretic and you, and you receive it and you say, all right, let me go study this out. This is where we're to be like Bereans. Let me go study this out. Let me see what the Word of God says about this. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's like I can think of, well, I can think of quite a few ministers because I've watched a documentary recently about false teachers and uh, a bunch of malarkey and stuff like that. But anyway, there's so much that even as, as this gentleman would play audio of them saying things or give excerpts from their book, I can think of like four or five scriptures, and I'm like, that doesn't line up with the Word of God. And then this man, he would, him being a pastor and a real man of God, he would just not you know, huffy and puffy and just you know, tearing the house down, but just tearing the house down brick by brick, but just by quoting scripture. And I'm like, man, I love this guy. This guy is awesome. Because he was, he was combating this false doctrine with what? The Word of God. That's the way we should be. We should know enough of the Word of God. When somebody tries to feed us malarkey, we can say, no, I'm not receiving that. That's malarkey. Let's pitch it out there with the terriers. Let's pitch it out there with all the other false things that have tried to come my way. But we've got to know the Word enough to be able to judge those things. And if we don't, we go home and study it to prove it or to disprove it, however the case may be. That's the reason it's important for us as soldiers to know the battle guide, to know our NCO, ask questions to the NCO, the Holy Spirit, to talk to the commander-in-chief, God the Father. What do, you, what do you say about this? Maybe help reveal things through your word. And guess what? That NCO, the Holy Spirit, will show you. That's part of what he does for us as believers is he's a revealer of things. He helps us understand the things of God. But it still requires us to get into the word to have those things revealed to us. Amen. So 2 Timothy 3, 5, King James Version says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. And the New Living Translation, that same verse, says they will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. The power that could make them godly. It reminds me of James one twenty one. It says, when it says that uh, the word of God, the engrafted word that is able to save your souls, it doesn't mean that it will. It has the ability to, but it's up to you if you let it. So this comes here, even in this verse, it says they will act religious, which we live in a religious region, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. So in other words, I can think of denominations right now in this region that says anytime there's a revival and a move of God, oh, we don't want part of that. We've got to separate from that. That's how they created their denomination, by separating themselves from the Holy Spirit and the moves of God. You tell me how godly they are, but they will act religious. If you don't belong to our denomination, you're going to hell. Wait a minute, what? You're the one running from God and I'm the one going to hell? I think you got this twisted, brother. I think you need to get on your face and seek Jesus. You need to seek the Holy Spirit. He might even make you speak in tongues. Then who's going to hell? By your belief, that's what you believe. Anyway, (laughs) 
Uh, I feel a little punchy this morning. This is spiritual, spiritual region anyway. But the Bible even says, stay away from people like that who act religious, but they deny the power that could make them God. They'd actually serve God and love God. Stay away from those people. Don't be around them. Stay away from those false allies because they're terrors. So if you know that they're a terror, and maybe you don't, well, even if they are in the, in the same church with you, doesn't mean you have to fellowship with them. Amen. <laughs> there are, there's times, you know, we'll go to different churches and stuff, and you can tell maybe little clicks and things that are going on, and I'm like, yep, I don't want to be a part of that clique because y'all are all gossipers. Yep, don't want to be a part of that clique because y'all are, are all having fun together, and I don't mean out of the bed. And then we go over here, mm, I don't want to be a part of that. I can fellowship with these people over here. They love God. You can see it all over them. You can see the fruit of the Spirit working in their life. It's on the, the countenance of their face where they actually smile, and you can tell that there's a joy in their life. Amen. There are important words located within, these, within this verse that hold a clearer picture of God's meaning for Christians to understand the difference between his soldiers and those that wear the uniform but do not pledge allegiance to him. <laughs> to understand, for Christians to understand the difference between his soldiers, the true biblical soldiers, and those that wear the uniform but do not pledge allegiance to him. So the word form means the appearance the fashion, exact image, to have the exact image. But as the verse, as we know, says that it denies the power. So it has the outward look, but it denies it on the inside. Just like the bearded dar darnel it has the outward look, but on the inside it's got that black grain. So it's not going to bring any true growth. Although the appearance is the exact image, something is missing from this person's heart. Something's missing from the person's heart because that's really where everything is determined. It's in your heart. Now, we could say your mind is associated with the heart because, but even if we take it Romans, Romans 10 tells us that out of the heart you believe and with the mouth you confess. The heart's got to believe. That's the reason it's called two-part faith is you can confess it all day long, but if your heart's not associated with it, it does you no good. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. But if your heart's not associated with it, it doesn't mean anything. I can think of different people who will say that and then turn around and, and beat their spouse. Beat their kids. I don't mean discipline their kids. Beat their kids. Punch them in the face. Hurting them. Doing abuse. Not discipline, abuse. Then they'll turn, I love you, I love you. You're telling them, you're giving them the world's definition of love. That's not biblical love. But yet, false allies would do the same thing. <laughs> Much like we said recently. Somebody said, I love you, pastor, and then two weeks later, they're nowhere to be found. <laughs> I love you, pastor, I love this church. <laughs> Let me back up a little bit because I don't want to have a knife all of a sudden stab me in the back. Let me back up a little bit more. <laughs> in two years, I've had that happen quite a few times. Eh, whatever. Par for course in a religious region. That's the reason I'm spiritually and biblically tough. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So the form of godliness looks good on the outside. Godliness, defined as holiness, reverence for God, motivated by the fear of God or caution more than by love for God. So we can say it's, it's got a holiness appearance. It's got a reverence for God. It's motivated by fear, by the fear of God or caution more than a love for God. Because if you really have a love for God, you don't want to do anything because you don't want to hurt your relationship with Him. But if you have an have a appearance of godliness... Just the appearance only, not the power, not the love, but you have just the appearance, then it's more of a, I better do this or God's going to get mad at me. God could strike me dead. God could do this. God could take my, my, all, my bank and, all my bank account. God could take this from me. God could take that from me. Because you remember what happened to Job? That shows, one, you don't love God, and it shows, two, you don't know your Bible. Because Job's the only idiot in the Bible that said, <laughs> that said, God giveth and God taketh away. 
That's because he didn't have any doctrine. He didn't have good doctrine. But we, having the fullness of the word now, can see it's not God that takes away. It's the enemy that seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. So we've got to recognize where it comes from and who it really is that's trying to take away from us. Anyway. But if a true love for God will say, I don't want to hurt my relationship with him. I don't want to disobey him. Amen. So this form holds no true love or servitude. This form holds no true love or servitude. You can tell who loves each other because they, they serve one another. Amen. You can tell who really loves one another by who serves one another. The form of godliness denies God. Denying means contradict, to renounce, to reject, to desert the Christian faith, to apostatize, the desertion or departure from one's religion, principles, or cause. This contradiction or desertion separates the fake soldier from the true soldier of God. A true soldier, something comes up, a true soldier runs to God and says, Lord, what does your word say? How do I need to handle this? A fake soldier, when something comes up, they'll run to the world. They'll go get drunk. They'll have sex. They'll do other things. They seek the world's attention because they don't really know God. They don't really love God. So when times of trouble and issues come, you, for the majority of the time, you will run to who you love for help and, and let's say, comfort, we'll say. Kind of a bad word, but solace. Somebody to, have, to have, somebody to help you. Somebody to turn to, to seek wisdom, things like that. So it shows who you really love and when you run to in those times. If you run to God, praise God. That means you love God. If you run to the world, then that means you, you love the world more than you love God. But having this, the look of a soldier does not make the person that person a true soldier. Even in the natural world, some people try to imitate soldiers. This is called stolen valor. It is also illegal. <laughs> Being in the military, we used to watch videos every once in a while. I guess it was just because we had nothing better to do while we were waiting around for formation or whatever that was going on. But it would make us all mad. I mean, like fighting mad. Like want to go out and hurt somebody mad. Because you would see these videos on the internet where this young guy is probably... Mid, mid to late 20s, is walking around in this uniform. He's got all these things decked out and got a big rank on his, you know, his arm and all these, you know, all these, uh, I'm trying to think of the actual word, all these stripes that go down, go down the arm. So for, for anybody who's never been in the military, that may sound like, well, okay, I don't, I don't understand that. Well, to have all these medals means that you've been in service and you've earned every one of them. The rank that he had was like a command sergeant major. There's no way in the world a young man in his 20s would ever make command sergeant major. You've got to be in at least, I would say, mm, uh, the upward side of 15 years, at least, to make command sergeant major. Then to have all of these, that means how many deployments, how long you were on deployments for. So to be that long, it was probably half of his life. As many as he had. So that shows, one, he's an idiot because he hasn't done his research. But two, it shows that he's wanting everybody, he's wanting the attention from everybody to show how much he's done and how much he's decked out and to have all of these accolades and awards to get the attention of others. But then the video, <laughs> God bless the USA. In the video, this, whoever is recording this is an actual soldier. And choose this guy out calls him out in the middle of this big crowd where everybody's kind of giving him attention, this guy starts calling him out and quoting all of these facts. And the looks on everyone's faces as they begin to look at him and their, the, the look for, of, of honor and pride all of a sudden goes to terror and we want to tear you apart. Why? Because he duped every one of them. Because at one point they were all giving him accolades, they were all giving him attention, they were loving on him. And then when the truth comes out, everybody run him in the ground and have one, didn't, have anything, didn't want to have anything to do with him. Why? Well, I mean, because it's, it's logical because if you've been lied to, you don't want to be around that person. You, you break trust. 
Once you break trust, it's hard to gain it back. Is it impossible? No, it's not impossible because all things are possible with God. But is it very hard and difficult? Yes. Because even the word tells us, if we've kind of quoted this at the last few services, even the word tells us when somebody falls to sin, you can restore them if they repent, but then you must keep an eye on them. You restore them, but you're cautious to say, let's not, let's not let this happen again. Let's not be deceived again by this person. We love them. We've restored them into fellowship with us, but we've got to be careful that they don't fool us again. I heard a wise man once said, Gomer Pyle, so not too wise. I'm being a little sarcastic. He says, you fool me once, shame on you. You fool me twice, shame on me. If Gomer Pyle can have that kind of, now granted he's a fictional character, we understand that, but if that idiot that's portrayed on a TV show can have that kind of wisdom, why can't the body of Christ? To say, all right, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt once, and we'll, we'll want to bless you and help you, but we're not going to let you do this again. You want to keep falling to sin, we'll, we'll restore you. you. You repent, we'll restore you into the body of Christ. We'll restore you to let you come in fellowship. We're going, we got our eye on you, and we're not going to let you deceive us again. You're going to have to earn that trust. You're going to have to earn that back. Because if the Word of God says it, then we as true Christians and true soldiers, we've got to abide by the Word. To say, all right, we forgive you, we love you, we drop the charges as soon as you did it. Because that's biblical too. But we're going to be cautious not to let you deceive us again. Amen. So anyone who imitates in being a soldier of God is committing stolen valor in God's eyes. This happens a lot. People saying, oh, I love God, I love God, I'm one of His. And they, they do nothing to live as a Christian. They do nothing to live as Christ did. So may, may we never become false allies. May we never become fake soldiers. Amen. That should be the warning in this lesson for us this morning is to really take to heart, Lord, may I never be a false ally. May I never fall for any of these things, Lord. May I never be puffed up in pride. May I never be a, a terror or a bearded darnel that I don't bow to you, that I don't bow to the things of God, that I stand direct. Don't let me ever do that, Father. Help me. Give me wisdom. Help me to see that. Part of that catching that is not only being, listening to the issues of your heart and turning that up and magnifying and hearing what your heart is really saying, but it's also using the gifts and the things that God has given you. Even Jesus Christ gives us the fivefold ministry gift to help us, to shape us and to mold us into who we need to be, to help us mature and stay away from those things. Amen. Christians should be genuine soldiers of God that dedicate their lives to His plan and vision. Galatians 5, 24 and 25, New Living Translation says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to His cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. God desires His soldiers, his soldiers to have a heart after Him and not just seek His protection when the battles are raging. So you can tell who really loves God, who's a soldier of God, because they've, they've nailed the passions, they've nailed the desires of their sinful nature to the cross. Now granted, that, reminds, that takes us to 1 John, where it says those who practice righteousness, those who practice being in right standing with God, those are the children of God. That's what you habitually do day in and day out. You practice being in right standing. You practice being a holy person. Doesn't mean that you'll never you know, make a mistake. Doesn't mean that you'll never sin. It means that that's what you practice all the time. Is just being in right standing with God. And when you do sin, you're like, Father, forgive me. And God says, all right, I know that that's not what you use to practice. I forgive you. And it's wiped away. It's helped us. It's washed away for us. That we can continue to be in that habitual state of practicing righteousness. But somebody that practices lawlessness or iniquity, that's what they practice. So they may have a good action here and there. But their action is, their habitual lifestyle is to practice that lawlessness or iniquity because it's all about them. They don't love and honor God. So his desire is for his soldiers to be holy, not just through action, but through a heart seeking after his righteousness. If the heart of a person is aligned with God 
and his righteousness, their actions will reflect that heart as well as having the power of God in their lives to back up the genuine love and obedience for God. So may, as, may we as Christians discern who are true comrades and who are false allies within the army of God. And again, may we never be those false allies as well. Amen.